eventually yeah. anyway. Why does it say defend um oh Umberglade Woods is the supply camp they just took. Dang it. Why Fort Aspenwood? Here they are. Oh. Uh, dropping stun field. And meteor shower. Oh snap, is that a lot of dead bodies? That is a lot of dead bodies. There's wow. some freaking <laughs> ogres. That was awesome actually. All right, ladies and gentlemen. That worked so well. <laughs> they didn't even know it hit them. That was a uh, sure about though. a dozen people yeah, all, all rolling finished. with Team Legacy, including Great and, and a couple other TL people, door. defending our Bravos escarpment against our enemies. About 40, maybe 30 to 40 Fort Aspenwood players. Wow, dude. That, was that was an extremely efficient siege, and here's why. You can see right here on this particular screenshot that we have three ballistas set up right at the door. We also had two guardians. Great was one of those guardians. And they basically set up uh, lines of warding. Is that the spell great that prevents them from coming in? Yeah, that's, it's just like a straight line. You cannot pass that. No going by. So they couldn't get to the siege equipment. Balliste themselves basically passed directly through everybody in their path, doing damage to everybody. They what is it, freelancer? They don't have the five person cap, right? That's why they oh. do so much damage. Yeah, they can just go because it's not actually hitting five. You know, it's not hitting five people at once. It it goes through and hits one, 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 one. You know, like that. So it's it's different. Um, we had plenty of screens where, it, unless unless we're looking at something crazy, but we had plenty of screens where it was hitting like up to six, seven people at one time. So. Yeah, so that was just complete obliteration. They tried to rush in the door all at the same time, and instead they just all took three uh, ballistae to the face. So that's that's what they get for coming after Bravo's Discarpment. That's that was our castle on Saturday morning there when uh, when everybody else was asleep because I had planned to stay up for the whole server switch, and then I found out that I set my alarm incorrectly. So when I uh, when I woke up at like eight o'clock in the morning, I'm like, damn it. But then I came on and there's nobody on. I'm like, I will champion our server while everybody else is sleeping. <laughs> so that was a great time. We did that how many more times, Great, before they finally learned their lesson oh, and came man. into the we, side? We were in that corner of the map for like four hours maybe. Just like we got to defend the supply camp. Go, 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 go. Got to go defend this tower. Go, go, go. We were like running around and we're like, set it up, set it up, set it up. Go, go, go. And every Amazing. time – they would come in with this massive zerg that would always be accompanied with the stupid ogres. Like, every time they happened to attack us, the ogres would be on the way down. And we're like, no, quick fall back to Bravos. That was like our, our homeland. We kept falling back to the tower, and they kept coming straight in. <laughs> oh, man. They finally I got, realized I got that, to though. hear about it. Like, as soon as I logged on, um, it was like, it wasn't great. It was somebody else that was running with great in them. It's like, you just missed the coolest three hours ever, Freelancer. And I was like, okay, well, show me the video later. And sure enough, they were right. So. Jace was there, I think, along with us. Uh, there's a couple other people from TL. Another couple of people that were just, you know, pubs hanging out in the in the TL, um, what you call it, the TL uh, team speak there that just decided to join us. And we got a couple of pubs to show up with the map chat, like, please help us. All right, but you know what was very, you know, frustrating that morning is it seemed like we had way more of the uh, Fort Aspenwood people online as Crystal Desert people, and yet we had people sitting there trying to get in the whole time. So, Freelancer, did you did you look into this? There was some bug, right, that was causing issues with World versus World this weekend? Yeah, I got a little rant on that, but I'm going to be nice. Um all right, so the way that the queue system was working, um, and you can go read a read in that, everybody's like, well, you know, you're just saying that for excuse. No, actually, a read in that finally posted officially on it was when we got, and we didn't really experience it until we faced Gat Gates of Madness and Fort Aston, but it was if one side, and they fixed this, so it's not an issue anymore, but if one side um, fills up their, their limit, which I think the limit was, what, 166 or something like that, um, for a map, then it would it would basically flag the that map as full for all three sides. 
So what ended up happening on Saturday, because obviously getting paired up against Gates of Madness and Ford Espenwood, that was like the three big servers, right? You know, um, Ford Espenwood had a lot more people online. And uh, that's because they had, obviously, they had the Oceanic community there as well. And uh, Gates of Madness. So they rush out and we're, we're organizing our groups. And we find out about after about 30 people get in that it's locked. And we're like, and we're, you can see this on the stream. I like epic raged about it. I'm like, what do you, what do you mean it's like? What do you mean you guys can't get in? And um, it turns out because Ford Asperwood had maxed out the players. And so we're, we're sitting there kind of twiddling our thumbs. We're like, well, how do we fix this? We only have 25 people in the Eternal Battlegrounds. Um, within about 10 minutes later, we got like 40 people in Eternal Battlegrounds. And here we are with Ford Aspenwood running around with like 100 plus, and we took screens and everything and complained. And it was it was like, okay, well, there's nothing we can do about this. You know, so this is just Saturday. We're going to deal with it. Ford Aspenwood is probably going to go all up in arms saying, oh, we stomp Team Legacy, yada, 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 yada. And, you know, they that's fine. You know, we're, we're not going to react to that. But um, then it was from Gates of Madness, they were having the same issue. So... Uh, Team Legacy, the Ascension Alliance, we were having this big issue getting into any map whatsoever because it was being filled by one of the servers. And uh, it turned out the rest of the alliances had the same issue. Well, it was actually really cool. A member from the from the Titan Alliance, which is like our, our rival alliance, you know, that we, we like to always joke about. Um, they actually uh, logged on and sent me a message saying, look, uh, I'm from XX Guild and Gates of Madness, um, and they know who they are. I'm just not mentioning their name. Uh, you know, I know, I noticed you guys can't get in. We can't get in either. You know, I just want to give you a handshake that the people we have seen you fight, uh, or that we have seen from your server fight. I'm, you know, like the five, 10 man groups that we've seen, um, they are some of the toughest groups we've ever faced. And I think you guys are awesome. And it was like a virtual handshake, you know, like we couldn't do anything about the server queues. Ford Aspen Woods rolling over everybody because they already maxed out the servers. And, uh, it was like a respect thing. And, and I thought that was really cool. It like increased my my respect for the community like a hundredfold um and uh it was really cool to see that and then they fixed it so then it got to the point where um it was a little later that later that night about five six o'clock uh every they fixed it and everybody could log on and then crystal desert crystal desert all of a sudden was doing you know everybody could get even matchups and we were fighting and we had some epic battles and uh it was a good time and then of course the servers reset but by that point you know, Ford Espenwood had that entire morning since start to take everything, and it was like, eh, well, it's beta. You know, you can't complain about beta, right? <laughs> they found the bug in the beta, so you know what? There yep. you go. Absolutely. That's, that's exactly what this is for. I mean, as, as many people as, as uh, uh, ArenaNet probably has testing this stuff, you know, in their internal QA team and things like that, they really can't. There can't possibly be hundreds of thousands of people all stressing the servers in the internal QA team. It's just not that big. So that's exactly what these are for. We might even see another stress test before the launch specifically to make sure that this kind of, you know, bug in World vs. World is ironed out. I really wouldn't be surprised if we did. I mean, that, that seems like it would be, you know, a sort of stress test a week before launch just to make sure I would, well the, the bug is ironed out because uh at the towards the end of that night like when they you know they brought on down all the servers everybody was like why are they bringing on servers well all the people in world v world knew why and mm -hmm. as soon as the servers came back up we we're like okay let's try this one more time let's try to go out there and face you know condemned and titan and all them let's try to knock back all these fort aspenwood you know random zergs that we saw and there was a few guilds but it was like mass amounts of players and we, we all got in, and it was like, this is awesome. And, and the rest of the night was perfect. Now, it was still very laggy. I think anybody that got in, like, especially around when people were sieging Stone Mist, it was so incredibly laggy. It was insane. But at least we could get everybody in at that point. So they fixed it, but now I believe they've said in another ArenaNet post, we'll have to bring that up for the show notes, but um, that they're increasing the CPU cycles a little bit by little bit to get to the limit. So they fixed the queues. Everybody mm -hmm. can queue in now, Crystal Desert, next time we finally get paired against Gates of Madness. I'm looking forward to it uh, for a fair matchup. Ford Aspenwood, man. Eh, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, we could finally have a fair matchup. Now what ArenaNet needs to do is actually just sort of beef up those computers so that not only can we have a fair matchup, but we can do it without so much lag. So. 
Exactly. And and the the original bug that caused them to lower the caps in the first place was just a bug that caused the world versus world maps to use more CPU than normal. So if you right. lagged in world versus world this weekend, it's most likely due to that bug. Even though they basically cut the limit on players in half, so there were way less players in world versus world in general, people were still feeling lag. It's because that bug was in there. So uh, people who have played in beta weekend event number two and number one even know that you know this was an ab- abnormal situation this you know past weekend and that beta weekend number two was way uh, just smoother on everything even though it seemed to have more people and so that has everything to do with this bug and since they basically seem to have fixed it by Sunday night I'm sure that by uh, by release we'll we'll have a much smoother experience maybe even with more players you know I'm always hoping that next time the the the, the the cap is going to be a little bit higher because, um, you know, we always joke about the cliff boss in, in World v. World. Well, this weekend, the gate boss was the champion mob that everybody had to slay in order to actually play World vs. World. And it was a process of F, 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 F. Nope, that's too fast. That's too fast. I'm going to crash. Hang on. F, F. F, perfect. Keep it going. Keep the rhythm. I was actually reading a Kindle while doing this. We were falling asleep <laughs> at the gate. It was terrible. Does anybody Worst know if the Q ever. actually worked? Like, did the Q actually work? If you queued up and, like, went somebody el- somewhere else, did it work? I've heard stories and rumors of a friend of a friend who told me that they got into <laughs> it, but I never had it, like, actually work for me. So. Yeah, and I happened to crash about three times during the World v. World. And it was like, oh, man, because here I am, like, I'm part of the, I guess, the theoretical pug command. So we had, like, 12 groups going around, and then I had the commander icon. So it was far more beneficial for me to try to corral everybody that was in the in the central borderland. It worked very well. But then I crashed, and I was like, man, i got to get back in because they're all running around with their heads cut off, literally. Like, they had no idea what to do when I died or when I crashed. So um, I, I walked up, and I actually had a, a macro. This is how pathetic it is, all right, Bridger? I had a macro program that would press F for me like a hundred times a second. <laughs> and it, each time I got back, it was, it didn't take me less than a minute and I was right back in. It, it literally were, they, they like, I guess they took down the Q system. So it didn't matter if you were queued or not. It was just, if you happened to press F when somebody left. Yeah. And, and that was that. So, you know, I, I hope they, I hope they really get like a Q system, not only a Q system that works, but one that shows you like, you were XX in line. Would that not be nice? Absolutely. I mean, yeah. That's a lot of people were petitioning yeah. specifically for that, and the devs said that they're going to work on providing a feedback mechanism to you know show you what point in line you are and sort of an estimated time until you get in. And and that's all that I would want because it seemed like you were saying it's it seemed like to me that people that were spamming F on the door would basically cut the Q even when the Q was working or whether it wasn't working because the F always got you in. I even though if I went and hit the Q and then went and did crafting for an hour hour and a half I never got in but people that were spamming F on the door I was listening on TeamSpeak they'd say I got in I was like wait a minute I queued up like what the hell why can you cut me so uh, <laughs> you know we'll, we'll almost certainly see that you know tweaked out and fixed that seems like a really important thing to, to you know for the player experience so I'm almost certain we'll see that by launch get fixed not only does the queuing for world versus world need to be have that sort of feedback mechanism but the one for the overflow server needs that yep. feedback mechanism too yeah, so definitely. it's not just for PvP you know, I gotta say, I, I gotta say that after everything was fixed except for the queues, Bridger, were you there Saturday night when everything was fixed? It I was, was there like Sunday night at when that point. You know, I, I there was there's a lot of big servers out there, but I dare say Fort Aspenwood, Gates of Madness, and Crystal Desert were probably the big three. Um, like Jade, and there's a few others that were that were out there, but. When we got everything fixed, it was neck and neck the entire time. Oh yeah! Like, if Epic. you looked at my stream, like the like we actually got ahead a little bit, but then once all, all the gates guys logged on and stuff, it, it was neck and neck. It was such an amazing experience. I was so glad to see that because it tells me that once all these, you know, once we get our, our ladder system working in game, the servers get matched up, we always have some great battles to to look forward to because when we got paired up against gates and and the Titan Alliance and then Fort Aspenwood and well, there was just a whole bunch of guilds there that weren't really alliance, but um, it was just uh, neck and neck the whole time. It was really fun to play. I was just sad. I was sad that that happened so late in the day, unfortunately. Yeah, and and it definitely got a lot better, and it felt really epic once we got to that point. It was a little bit frustrating, but again, that's what betas are for. We're here to understand that. Uh, now we're just hoping that by the launch period, those kind of things are going to get you know ironed out. So um, let's talk about sentries. So. 
Sentries are a new thing in the World vs. World this weekend. They're basically single... Uh, veteran, <coughs> excuse me, cha uh, veteran mobs or char or, you know, Silvari, whatever, that are basically guards for caravan crossroads, places where caravans will almost certainly pass through and players will pass through in order to get from one place to another, and they will destroy caravans that try to go through them. I think that the caravans that have guards will probably get past them, I'm guessing, because I think the guards are also yeah. veteran, uh, but do, single because. caravans don't. So, okay, yeah, there you go. Now, yeah, they uh, if you upgrade the guards twice, they are just strong enough to get past these border checkpoints. So. Oh, really? You need to upgrade them twice in order to do it? Wow. Okay. Yeah, you have to you have to fully max out the supply campus on the guard side, and uh, they are just strong enough to you know if somebody decides to come by a solo player and take that little checkpoint or whatever they call it, they'll be strong enough to kill. Gotcha. And they need the help of the Doliac and stuff too. <laughs> yeah, the Doliac <laughs> the needs to participate. Alone, yeah, the guards alone are not strong enough to kill the guard, but if you watch it, if you ever caught any of my footage, uh, we watched it in the Doliac in conjunction with the guards teaming up on this little uh, zealot or, you know, the guy with the sword, um, actually will take him out. But that he barely wipes out both guards in the Doliac doing so. So it's good to know that you can spend the money to fully upgrade and not so much have to worry about that. Yep. Now, so what are, what role do you think? Great, you you're playing in the world of your world. What role yep. do these centuries provide from like a game design perspective? Why are they there? Well, other than to harass the caravans, I think they're sort of like mini objectives that you kind of like are between things. So like they're between a tower and a supply camp, and your group can kind of like steamroll it and get there. But they provide. I think it was in there when they sort of announced it. They said we want this to be sort of something for smaller groups to be able to do. So to get these capturable points and give or you... even single player. I think they call yeah. them yes, single player does. objectives. I mean, those guards are tough. So I don't know about single player. You, know, you better I, come I, like I top solo notch veterans, skill. But yeah, you do, you do need to know what your, what, how your class you works. You gotta know your way out of dodge. Out. Like, you gotta be ready for that. <laughs> yes, <laughs> absolutely. So, uh, let's, let's ask this question. Um, I think they mentioned that they give some kind of a score, but I never, I forgot to pay attention. Um, they give one point. One point, just one time? It's not a per five minute period? I think it's one point when you kill the guard. I'm okay. going to have to double check that. I just can't see that ever making a huge difference. I don't know, maybe. Maybe, because Sunday night we were always talking about how uh, it was Isle of uh, Janther and Maguma, right, that were really neck and neck, like 100 points off out of, like, it was like 29,970 and 29,850, some ridiculously <laughs> close thing. And then while they're battling it out, we're setting up 25 Trevor's. <laughs> <laughs> Well, like, you guys go ahead and claim your second place victory. We're going to go over here and troll people coming to our <laughs> flag camp. <laughs> oh, man, that's true. That's true. So, uh, so, so I kind of think they could be using, you know, one point per century per five minutes. That wouldn't be too bad. But right now it seems like they only give one point period. So then they go back and forth. It's just like, a, you know, whoever tags as many of them as possible gets points, I guess. I don't know. Uh, so, so is there any problems with them? Do you, do you see? A, are they like just an annoyance? Do they actually fill the role that they need? Are they good? Are they bad? Um, I think they're a little bit annoying because like, like people can get distracted and be like, oh, we gotta go kill this sentry, but we're going to that supply camp. Why don't we just go there? Why do we have to stop and kill this guy? But I think it, they, I think uh, they could be like patrols, maybe that kind of go up the roads. That would be pretty cool to see happen, because then that means, like, you have to watch out. You can't just, like, run all over the place. I mean, there's enough wildlife in World of This World that you're going to get destroyed if you're not careful, but it would be nice to see more, like, guard presence on the map at times to catch people, maybe help uh, break sieges and stuff like that. Yeah, it's very interesting, especially because it's going to give you those cross swords if more than six people try to engage the guard and take him down at the same time. If you have to, like, everybody's marching past the guard, you know, Freelancer's like, okay, only two people take him on. Nobody else touch him, because otherwise we're going to show up on the map. We're ninja here. <laughs> ninja vanish. So. Hey, hey, hey. Shh. We, don't, we don't give away our tactics. Oh, no. I'm sorry. <laughs> Ninjas do not speak of taxes. <laughs> yeah, it was like his... Um... I think if five players, if they five players attack one mob, then like orange swords pop up, you know. And then if you have like up to three, or if you have three, like white swords show up. And if you have two, then nothing shows up, and you can be all ninja about it. So it's it's funny. And then here we are running around with like, we were all in. I think it's Domus. We were doing the trebuchet thing or golden thing at the time. 
and we were just running around with like 40 people getting supply for golems and stuff. <laughs> and we were trying to get just two people to, to attack them. It was never happening. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody attack them except you. No, no. Oh, never mind. The pugs did it already. They're already taking it out. Nope. Orange swords. There it is. All right. So another change I noticed this weekend. Um, supply, uh, the uh, the siege does not build instantaneously. You have to sit there and hammer the thing a couple of times. Did you guys notice this? How does that yeah. affect the game, Freelancer? That, uh, it changes a couple of our tactics, especially with open world. Like, we have a couple of SOPs where if we engage, like, X amount of players, we lay down a ballista or an air cart at these particular locations, and it, it's, it gets crazy. You guys know we're, we're crazy about World v. World, but we have them all set down, you know, and, it, and it's locked in, but when we're going out to World PvP this time, you lay down, you know, you have people, okay, we're laying air cart here, you know, ballista here, well, they run up and they have to hammer it. And that's such a big deal because now people are AOEing the heck out of you while you're building that ballista. <laughs> so it changes everything. It was, it was a big difference. Do you think it's a positive change? Um, yes. I'm going to bite, bite my tongue saying that. Yes, I think it was. Because <laughs> even though yeah. it gives us a bit of a disadvantage, we can't do our, our cool thing anymore. Uh, we still, well, we still yeah, kind of makes the game better. Because it stopped the trolls from, from running up into the middle of a group and building a catapult and then going to spread shot and immediately hitting everybody in the area, which we did not do. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it was a completely overpowered strategy. Uh, and it got rid of all those like flash mob type, you know, build siege weapons. Um, it, it, it adds a little mechanic to it. Because let's be realistic here. You can't just instantly place down, you know, uh, a ballista or a trebuchet so it was interesting i i don't really know either way how, how i feel about it yet all right did so you see that video about the forest of the unbuilt siege weapons oh i i have that in don't yeah, I have this uh, in here where so is it i gotta find it shout out to uh to a guy from da uh that was posting on the guru forums but you know now that you, you can't instantly build things and well let's just say there's no limit on the amount of blueprints you can place if we can find that, that would be amazing. But this guy went around the entire map placing arrow cart blueprints. And I was like, <laughs> man, why didn't Team Legacy think of that? <laughs> That's exactly what I thought. So, I mean, we went mass trebuchets, bulbs, et cetera. Why didn't we go mass blueprints? <laughs> he but, calls uh, it Forest of Forgotten Foliage. <laughs> I don't think this is foliage, though. Let me pull it up here. There it is. <laughs> this, wow. It just goes on and on. It looks like a junkyard, like you know, with those cars, oh. like just <laughs> abandoned. That must have taken some time. I'm not gonna lie. To place all those guys now, down. According those, to the those... video, this is one guy did all of this. I there believe. must have been must have been pugs like jumping in, like I'll help. But he made <laughs> he made <laughs> like a pathway all the way down the road. <laughs> this is just wow. ridiculous oh that's great and those of you uh, listening not watching just imagine when you place a blueprint and uh, all right you, you know if somebody has to build it well imagine just saying to hell a building it let's place as many as possible across the entire world <laughs> that's pretty much what you get here there uh, must be seem like hundreds of them I, you know, I want to meet the guy that did that and ask him if there was like a timeout like how long they lasted there um you know, because that would be something I'd be curious about. But that was ingenious. I love it. That, that's the kind of ideas that Team Legacy is trying to... Like, we did naked flash mobs. I don't know if we talked about that yet. <laughs> we did... Like, we poured it in with, like, a bunch of naked TL members, danced around somebody, poured it back out. <laughs> it, was, it was hilarious. Uh, we did, like, the mass trebuchets. Hang on. I got, I got some footage of that one right here. There it is. And we didn't think of the mass oh, forest. <laughs> that's really clever. Oh, this poor guy has no idea. We're, <laughs> We're just running around. <laughs> I'm sorry again about the video quality. This is a very, very high, high quality video. It can't play it at the same time as it can encode everything. <laughs> and then we try to do Ninja Vanish afterwards. We realized we didn't, we didn't set up the other exit of our teleporter. <laughs> the goal is to like be there and then like be out. But instead, we were like, Woo, it's a flash mob. Um, See ya, we're gonna walk away now. <laughs> that was, it completely cheapened the experience, but it was hilarious nonetheless. <laughs>
<laughs> but yeah, this one was fantastic. That's like the the trolleys of troll. And I saw people posting on the you know on on Reddit and other places like, oh, that this is ridiculous. Something must be done. I'm like, really? Something must be done? Like this guy just wasted huge. How much gold could possibly be sitting there spewed all over the, the world versus world? It's just a complete waste because you know what? That money doesn't matter. We're gonna make it all come back <laughs> when we start the game again. It all disappeared, got deleted anyway. So it's not the yeah. Big reminder to everybody: if you bought gems and stuff, like I bought twenty dollars, and we had the other guild members spend money, and then they kept asking the question: you know, is this gonna carry over? Yes, it's gonna carry over. So we're throwing it out there. Ninety percent of you know this already, but if you bought gems, you don't have to worry about it. Log into the same account uh, next time on live launch. Uh, Man, that sounds so good to say that. Um, <laughs> and you will have those same gems. Another thing that was neat, um, a lot of people asked is, can I change my name or can I change my email? And if you looked on the Arena Net forums for that too, because for me, I wanted to change it. And um, you can actually, they'll give you that ability to change all that come before launch. So if you didn't really like your account name because it was showing up, some people, for example, I don't know if you saw this, Bridger and Kai, did you have guild members, like their real name was showing? Yeah. You know, yeah, I had that. In the first beta weekend, I had my real name, which was a massive inconvenience because people add you to their friends list, even if you don't yep. know about it. And then, the like, group. next thing I know, I had Facebook friend invites, and yeah. it was, and I was <laughs> like, yeah, we got to fix this. So I went looking on um, on the forums, and they said you can officially change that too. So I thought that was nice. We get that out there to all the viewers, so you know you can do that. Um, it's good news. Yeah. All right. So um, commander book was at three gold, is now at a hundred gold. And I think I read somewhere that uh, it was only at three gold so that people could tr play around with it. So I didn't see any of these commander icons running around. Oh, except for freelancers. He's the <laughs> only person on any server that can afford a hundred gold commander book. Um, so uh, what do you think of that new price? Is that going to, you know, I do think a it better... needs to go up further. Do you think it needs to go up further? Yeah, oh. there's, nobody should be able to get a commander icon one day into launch. Um, that's just silly because, you know, we're going to be coming out with these economy guides and, and, and every, you know, most of the community is smart. They're going to figure out how to get their own money and stuff as well. And no, I'm not talking about gems. I'm talking about trading posts and farming certain items. Even then a hundred gold was not hard to get. You know, we got like 50, 60 ish gold, uh, from gem donations. And then, you know, we had like 400 again, by the end of the beta, we could have afforded three commander icons. We're not special. Any guild can do that. So having every guild do that, especially any guild focusing on the trading posts, because another thing, Bridger, is not many people probably paid attention to the trading posts. You know, mm -hmm. this is beta, and when we have a lot more people doing that, a lot more people are going to have money. I think just skipping everything, I think it should be like 300 or 500, because at that point, Bridger, it's not a matter of whether you have that much money. It's a matter of whether you think it's worth it. You know, at mm -hmm. three gold, nobody gave a second thought about it, right? You know, it's three gold, oh, no, no biggie, I'll, I'll get it again. At 100 gold, it still felt like that. It still felt like, uh, you know, like it's just 100 gold. And that's for coming from a guild leader. To any guild leader will feel that way. You know, it's mm -hmm. just 100 gold. It's worth it because I'm leading this guild. And, but I, I think it should be even more than that. I think it should be like a really, like a big conscious decision that your guild has to make. You know, is this commander icon going to help with, you know, with our server efforts? If you asked me, was the 100 gold worth it? Yes, to an extent. But um, is it, does it need to go up? Yeah, I think, it, I think it needs to be, I think it really needs to be a moral debate where I have to get to think, I got to say, is it worth 500 gold? You know, and I don't think many people, even if they have that money, are going to make that decision. They're, they're going to get away from it. Right. Um, You're saying But, you know, I still come back to Bridger. I still come back to where I don't think it should be gold at all. I think it should be, like, influence or I like think it should be influence. Or a rank or something i mean you want to ask freelancer what he thinks about the commander icon i think the whole idea is stupid to spend gold on it i really do i think that yeah. commanders out in the field whether it be freelancer or anybody else somebody from condemned etc all these big guilds big big alliances they should earn it you should not be able to go out there and spend god god awful amounts of money and just oh, okay i got an icon everybody follow me you know, that doesn't make you special. It's making you, it's like, being special is being respected. And I think, like, with Warhammer, for example, there was a similar concept. You had to earn it. You had to get so many kills and then get PvP influence and such. About but, badges of honor is what some people in the or, chat room are or saying. Or badges of honor. That's a great, I mean, that's a, that's a nice, simple currency that ArenaNet, I know they're not going to have to code a whole new thing into it. 
that they could switch it over to. I think that's an excellent idea because then you could be sure that that guy on the mini map with that, you know, commander icon didn't just spend, you know, a ton of gems on it, you know, and then converted it to gold. Or he didn't just get his entire guild, which they could be the most casual guild out there, some RP guild. To, but if there's 500 to, of them. To, oh, I'm going to get so flamed by our peers now. But <laughs> uh, it's, uh, you can't, you know, you can be sure that if you see that icon, that's somebody you can follow. He knows what he's doing. At the very least, he has experience. And as Edwin I, points out, I'm sorry, go ahead, Kai. Uh, I was going to say, I completely agree. From not a PvP perspective, but a PvE perspective, you know, point of view. I was trying to lead kind of events and do meta events in various areas and kind of have like the keg brawl and stuff like that and try and organize like mass leveling. I think I, I did like a Silvari mass leveling a couple of hours and there was literally about 50 of us running around. And it's so annoying because everyone's just like, where's Kai? Where's Kai? Where's Kai? Where's Kai? And it's like, oh, I just need this commander icon. <laughs> and it, it's frustrating because it's like, I can earn like influence easy. Like we all do events. We work hard to get that. I can earn karma. I can do that. But the gold, it just felt like really like, I don't know. It just felt really strange to have to spend gold on it because it's, as you said, freelancer, you just kind of, you can get gold easy. I can spend, you know, my personal in real life money and just buy this commander icon, but then it just kind of feels cheap. Like, I don't know, you're just buying it and it's like, get a commander icon and people think like wow they've earned this this guild has like worked hard to get this icon as you said you can trust them they know what they're doing whether it's pvp or pve you kind of feel like you can rely on that person to kind of give you guidance but just buying it means nothing and that kind of annoyed me there has to be a class requirement of mesmer too <laughs> <laughs> edwin in the chat edwin shep saying um essentially the problem that I identified as well, which is anything that has a single time investment means that eventually everybody's going to have this thing, right? It doesn't matter if it's 500 gold. At some point, everybody's, you know, level 80. They've decked out all their armor. They've spent all their stuff. They've got a bunch of gold lying around. They're like, hey, I'll throw 500 gold this way and get a commander icon, you know? At, you know, three, four years down the line, there's going to be half the population of the game is going to have commander icons if it's a one-time wow. charge, right? So so the question is, are you willing to make this some kind of a mini subscription, like you must pay this much gold every year in order to continue to hold your commander icon rank or this much badges of honor, right? I mean, the whole idea behind this is it should be a sacrifice for the player in order to ensure that A, they really want to do this. Like, this is not just somebody who's like, oh, I wanna go get a commander icon because who cares, why not? You know, they wanted this to be a sacrifice where you're sacrificing yourself in order to be a leader because that's what a leader does. They sacrifice themselves a lot of the time. They jump on the grenade, they, they have to lead a bunch of pugs that are yelling at them for going the wrong way, you know, all kinds of crazy stuff. They sacrifice themselves. That's one of the qualities of a leader, right? Uh, so the, the, basically that's the point of the cost so the cost has to go up over time with inflation or it's no longer a sacrifice. I don't know. You know Great. That. Can you think of any way that we can fix this? What makes it better? I would actually like to sit down with like the arena net devs with this one and say like, what, why is gold tied to this? Like what was the original design decision behind that? Like, is it Eric Flanham? Who's the world of this world guy? Always posting Mike, around uh, there. Ferguson. Mike Ferguson. 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 Yeah. There you go. I always get everyone confused. But, like, I would like to say, like, what was the original thought behind this? Why is gold tied to this? Like, I don't understand why gold is tied to this. I, it's it's I, just I, because they wanted Silent to add a D. cost. Silent D just echoed my thoughts yeah. on it. Yeah, he well, just said a really good point. How many people here have played MMOs where there was actually a politics system? Like, where you could go to the town square, talk to an NPC, and vote on, like, people. Have you guys that'd ever be, played an MMO like so that? That would be so good. No, um, but it'd be good. <laughs> I mean, I see a lot of problems with that, but I also see a lot of fixes with that also. But, yeah, I don't know. Just throwing out ideas. I'm yeah, sure Arena Net's already hit on it. If you've got a big guild and a big alliance, for example, Freelancer and UTL guys, your alliance, if you kind of, between yourselves, say, right, Freelancer is going to be the commander for our alliance, that's enough people to vote to get Freelancer in. I mean, if you have a really big alliance and quite a lot of the server dominated, you'll easily get voted in. And I think that's what the whole respect thing goes down to. If you have people who respect you, they will vote for you. And if they don't, then you shouldn't have the commander title. If people don't want to follow you, then there's no point in having it in the first place because you'll have yes an icon but no one will like trust you or follow you around so i think voting would be a very good idea because that's the whole point like people reputation will follow you if they systems, want to yeah reputation systems are so so hard to 
really put into a game and make it work. Like like you pointed out, you know, if the idea is this is somebody who should be trusted, then, you know, oh, well, we can just get every single person in the guild to have a commander icon because we have everybody vote for everybody or something like that. Like, there has to be a way that you limit people's number of votes. Maybe they get a new vote every three weeks and they can spend it on somebody. Either if they're just following some random guy in World vs. World, they can say, hey, awesome, plus rep. And once people reach a certain threshold, they can have the commander icon. And maybe that threshold keeps going up over time. I don't know. That in, that has its own problems. I mean, it's a nightmare trying to design a system that really, because the metric you're looking for is leadership capability, and that is incredibly hard to measure in a game like this, like, automatically. Like, you just can't measure it yeah. automatically. And then you run into the problem where, like, the way I run, you know, Team Legacy and the way that I define leadership and my members define a good leader is far different from, you know, some of the other guilds on the server. So, you know, that, that's one of the major downsides, you know. And you know, then, we're, we're very militaristic, but there might be some casual guilds that do World v. World too, and they don't appreciate the way that Freelancer, you know, spews right. out all these orders and stuff. Whether he wins things or not, it doesn't matter. He, they don't like the way Freelancer talks. So they want a more relaxed approach to it, you know, and so they'll vote for that person. So you run into those problems as well. Um, you know, I think, I think just switching it, let, let's just be simple here. I think just switching it to the token end of story, you know, and then at mm -hmm. least you can not so much leadership, but you can be sure that the guy that's, that's getting that experience. or spending all of those tokens of honor on it is, has the experience, right? Yep, exactly. Now, and, and that is still a cost, right? Because those, those honor badges do have an actual value. You can spend them to get not only siege equipment, but exotic gear that's usable in, you know, World versus World and PvE, but that exotic gear, if you're just playing World versus World a lot, that's probably the easiest and best way to get exotic gear when you hit level 60, uh, is just, hey, bam, I've got that invaders something or other, or whatever they call it, you know, invaders pauldrons or whatever. So uh, I, I think that probably the easiest fix to this system that would, you know, do the least damage and have the best gain is, like you said, just switch it over to badges of honor, find a good number, you know, whatever it is. What is it, like 200 badges for one of those pieces of gear make it like cost an entire set of gear in order to get a commander icon or something but the problem there is it would take forever for anybody to get it to begin with so we'd spend months with no commander icons and the right. yeah that's the problem and the other I thing is I'll, I'll let you talk in a second kai but the other thing that i just identified and as freelancer was talking this just hit me is it's not just guild leaders that should have this i mean we were talking about this during the actual um game we, we we were organizing our group of pugs that was on team speak with us we had team legacy and all the people that jumped on a team speak to play with us we were organizing our own thing defending stone mist taking some stuff and there was another guy on our server by the name of beta egg you remember him uh, he was on oh, the server. Yes, 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 he yes. was on map chat all the time, organizing everyone who wasn't with us. All right, guys, secure Pangloss Rise. I want that locked down. Make your way over to Ogre Watch. He was typing away furiously the entire time. That guy may or may not have been a guild leader. If he wasn't, he deserves that leadership position just as much. Yeah, I, I remember that because we were. He he was one of the ones that was commenting in my stream that was renewing my faith in pugs. Because it seemed like, you know, he didn't really have a guild following him or anything, but he was sort of fulfilling. And, we, and we've all met these people on previous MMOs. It's that guy that doesn't really want to be a part of a guild, you know, like Team Legacy or whoever, but he still wants to be a part of the action and sort of develop his own reputation, you know, without the guild reputation. And he was doing it. Like, people were just, the first Saturday night, uh, people started listening to him. By Sunday night, people were following his commands. And you see him running around. No commander icon, but people following him. There needs to be more leaders like that in PvE or PvE and PvP, actually. And uh, it was a little refreshing to see that. Absolutely. That, that was really cool to see. And um, All right, so I think that kind of uh, brings us sort of to the end of the world versus world discussion that I had in mind. Did anybody else have any really awesome moments? I mean, we talked about the one uh, where we were fighting off Fort Aspenwood, but what did you guys have for really great moments in the, in the beta weekend here? Oh man, that's hard. All um, of it. Just pick one. <laughs> it's go ahead, great. It's hard because like every time you get in there after waiting in queue for like an hour, you get in there and it's just like the awesome just starts and it doesn't stop until really you like leave. So it's really hard to pick out like one thing. And I think that's that's one thing we're missing with the beta weekends is like this. It, this is going to go on for two weeks when we get it going, and it's going to be like a, a story unfolding over these two weeks. So I think. I want to say the entire sort of like 
story of the day. Like, we lost this, but then we went back later that night and grabbed it and all that crazy stuff. I, I distinctly <laughs> remember, Freelancer, you had a whole lot of fun playing what is essentially 3D scorched earth with a trebuchet, jumping on a mortar and, and playing tag with a trebuchet over, like, <laughs> the in the tower next door. Oh, that yeah, because there was, fun. A, who, who was it? Uh, Maguma? Isle of Janthier. Oh, it was no, Isle of Janthier, that's Isle right. Isle of Janthier. They're like friggin' roaches, man. Like, they'd set up <laughs> trebuchets, like, the random spots. And so I was playing Sink Your Battleship with this mortar, and <laughs> I was kind of, like, testing myself to see how many shots I could, you know, take out the next trebuchet. There was, like, eight within 30 minutes, and it was... I had a blast. It's uh, it's on my stream, but it was, like... It was hilarious, because they were just so determined to take Stoneness. Like, it was... They would not give up, and that determination alone was awesome. But... It, so trebuchets all over the place, catapults in random parts of our wall, because if you know, which I disagree with, if you set up a catapult somewhere on the side of a wall where there's no guards, you can knock down the wall and never put up a single cross swords. Oh, so wow. they were doing that too. Um, Maguma was doing that. Uh, but I'd say, you know, all of that was fun. I'd say probably the best battles I had, um, yeah, not to give any cookies or cupcakes to the Titan Alliance, but I had we had one particular battle out in uh, one of the Borderlands where a bunch of random guilds we noticed from Titan were assaulting, and it was just an epic battle for about an hour straight. I was out there. Uh, I was manning a catapult on top of the Keep Lord. We had arrow carts. They had catapults and arrow carts. I'm going to actually create a video of that. Ended up being a stalemate. They left, went to another area, and took it, but... We held on. It was like, you know, like the Alamo, and it was amazing, and we had a good time doing that. Now, you know, it's nothing too out of the ordinary, you know, not 100 trebuchets. We did the 24, 25 trebuchet thing. But just seeing those solid battles that you'll never forget, you know, that you spent an hour defending a tower. We all know that. You Have you ever had that spot, Bridger, where you, mm -hmm. you just, you were there for an hour, but you'll never forget that battle, you know, because yeah. it was like working with coordination. Okay, we got these these tag C and D guys coming around the right side. We need arrow cart down there. We need snare here so that the ballistic can hit them here. We need catapult spin 90 degrees to the left to hit this group. It was just a, a conjunction of a lot of things that worked all in synchron, uh, synchronized with each other. It worked really well. And then obviously, I think a lot of people share this feeling. Working with the Alliance, I actually was able to get, uh, I'd say 90% of the Alliance to, we all got on the same server finally. We were very worried about getting all on Crystal Desert, you know, because that was kind of the server we were on already. We had those population issues before. We got a, a good 90% of the Alliance on, and we had the private team speak going where all the guild leaders were talking to each other. And just working in conjunction, it was just, you know, and getting along was the biggest thing. It was just amazing. We all naturally knew what we needed to do. It was like, hey, Team Legacy is over here, but we could use some help over here. Or, hey, Resonance, you guys are over here. Or, hey, you know, Harlequin, you guys are over here all the different guilds um, and actually working together. And then it was like, we were playing a chess match with the, the Titan Alliance and a lot of the FA guys. So it was, you know, if we noticed that a uh, Kaden group was over here or an unlimited group was over here, we would assign people and actually say, okay, we need a counter over here or we need a, you know, and when you look at it at more than just being on the ground, you know, attacking and just randomly beating on a wall and you zoom out and play it like it's a risk game, you know, like a strategy game, uh, it's just so much more fulfilling. It was a lot more fun to do. There you go. That's everything. <laughs> All right. So for the listeners at home, how do they get to play it at the uh, risk chess level? All you have to do is create an alliance with many large guilds. <laughs> you know, I got to say, though, I got to say, though, alliances aside, Ford Aspenwood didn't have any, a major alliance on it, but there were dedicated guilds. Like this, I was always one on the forums on um, Guru and Team Legacy. Um, saying that, you know, unless you're part of Alliance, you know, you're pretty much, you know, going to be tossed aside. But there were guys in, like, uh, DA. There were guys on Fort Asmawood. Um, I, I know their tags. I don't know the names of the guilds um, that were, like, specific. Like, they would always be the ones that would take the supply camp and then move into a tower. Or they'd be the ones that lined up a wall. Like, they'd knock down a wall with a catapult, like I was telling you earlier. And then, the, you know, the Titan Alliance or whatever would come in and clean things up. So, like, they had a place, and they, it, it sort of felt like a group effort, and that really renewed my faith into these guilds that don't want to be part of Alliance, you know, and you can't blame them. You know, alliances have a lot of politics, a lot of drama sometimes, and um, the fact that seeing them go out there and be a real threat and be a real piece of that chessboard uh, was really cool to see. So, if you're in a smaller guild, uh, yeah, it's, you definitely, there's, there's definitely renowned faith there. You don't have to be part of a huge alliance to be, like, well-known, because... 
I will never forget some of those those tags and those guilds that I saw that were not part of Alliance out there. They were just wreaking havoc <laughs> and just putting thorns in all of our sides, and that's that's a good thing. All right, so uh, that about does it. Wait, wait, wait a minute. I'm I'm getting an update. <laughs> I, 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 I'm, we're going to go to our reporter in the field, Kai. Can you hear me? Yeah, I've got some information that's just come from Mike Ferguson, and he's just confirmed that they actually only display 10 commanders on the map at a time, and it's based upon the biggest squads. So if everyone buys a commander, it's only the ones with the biggest squads that will be shown on the map, and it's a maximum of 10 in any map. So Nobody that's interesting. Hears. The plot thickens. Yeah, so if everyone buys commander, it's completely useless unless you have a big squad that it's worth it for. That's what I take from it. Um, I'm sorry. Did you say <laughs> Mike Ferguson's listening to my show? <laughs> Maybe. <sighs> and after I got his name wrong, too. <laughs> God, I'm done. Right? That's it. <laughs> Count me out. So that, Brandon, that's kind that's of awesome. interesting. Don't hate on the devs. That they're, makes a lot of sense, though. That it's, makes a lot like of sense. Like this, yeah, it's like those threads you see of people bashing the beta and uh, like the crazy end end event thing, you know. Uh, and then they're like, "Oh, this game, you know, they can't even plan an end game event right, and all this other nonsense." And you can't help but people people have no <laughs> idea how complicated this game is. Like, I only took two programming classes in college before I decided, nope, that's not for me. But I have a <laughs> huge respect for the. Re ridiculous achievement that the state of this game currently is like you but just have you to what, understand Brandon, tell me any game you've played before this where on the community forums they are as active as they are with arena net i mean nowhere nowhere at all you know? um maybe not at least not no, on this scale i, I can think of a lot game. of small indie games but that's because they have a very oh, yeah, you know well, personal relationship about, but yeah. exactly on this scale i can't think of any like exactly like you're saying but me personally, like, I speak to an arena, at least one ArenaNet dev every single day, and so do a lot of my guild. I mean, even if whether it's just on Facebook Why or Twitter. Why haven't you Twitter's... introduced? I, I, we're not even <laughs> friends anymore. What is this? Oh, I just name dropped yeah. Mike Ferguson's talking to me. Uh, no, but it's I just, guess he doesn't want to talk to the press. I don't know. People tweet like. It's um, yeah. For for Twitter, it's our big contact. I know with Kai yeah. and ourselves, it's oh. Twitter and in other ways, and it's uh. It's, it's they good. They are so fight. proactive. Yeah. Tell me more about this Twitter. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, okay. I, I got to get more on that, I guess. All right. So uh, now, do we want to talk at all about our ridiculous 24 trebuchet thing? I'm going to put a, a, a video out about more about it in the future. We got a lot of great video and screenshots. But uh, let me actually see if I can pull out some screenshots here just, just to give you guys a taste. Of uh, the, the exactly. 25 cows going through there. What? <laughs> 25 <laughs> cows simultaneously going through the air. Where is it? Guild Wars 2 screenshots. Let me let me zoom in here and find out which are some of the good ones. Well, no, I, I'm actually yeah. not the one doing the tweeting. I have a, a incredible uh, co-leader, Boris, <laughs> does all the tweeting for us. No, that's not what I wanted. That's not the one at all. Whilst you're finding it, Bridger. Um... Someone just reminded me in chat, Vespa Court. Um, last night in beta, whilst we were waiting for the event, um, William Fairfield, one of the dungeon content designers, sat down in um, Holbrack and told like about 20 of my guild a story. And we were all sat down like little cross legs, and he was stood there telling us a story in chat. It was amazing. It was so much fun. There we go. So <laughs> we have 25 cows flying through the air here. There yeah, we sure. go. Uh, oh, it's I hate this stupid yep. button. Never works. There it is. There you go. Bada bing, bada boom. <laughs> 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 this is my favorite though. <laughs> their their trebuchets will blot out the sun. Then we will fight in the shade. <laughs> it's all I could think of when I took this picture. It's ridiculous. Look at that. Oh man. Yeah. When we get this video up for everybody, it's going to be like the March of the Golems. Just, you know, it's not there for EPing or anything crazy like that. It's just there because it's so hilarious. The awesome. I think, like, when we were starting this episode, Kai was watching the cow fly through the air, 
and she could not stop laughing for like a solid five minutes. I, can no, so I was like crying. I was just like, oh my God. I was, gonna, I was about, you know, I had started the show. I did the intro and I was about to like unmute you guys. And I couldn't tell if she was still laughing. And then I unmuted it very carefully. And I was like, oh, she's still laughing. I had to mute it again. <laughs> I was like, stop it. Stop it. I need to introduce the show. <laughs> the one lonely cow. Why? And then in the video at some point, Freelance is like, if so Somebody shoots another cow off without my say so. <laughs> right, and then everybody's going to be like, oh, freelights are so mean. <laughs> yeah. It was like, because we were trying to line up all of our, you know, fire shots and make our scene, like our action, you know, our yeah. action scene running away from the explosions and trying to get that safe. But somebody kept freaking launching a cow. The, it, like, premature, it just... <laughs> it, it, you know, premature e evacuation of the trebuchet, as it were. Uh, that's, that's what wound up happening. But yeah, really freaking cool. I'll, I got to pull up one more screenshot. Look at this. Look, at, hang on. If my button works. There it is. Look at this ridiculousness. Now that's blotting out the sun. If you're sitting under, if look at that, actually, is this true? Is that little house there like in darkness right now because of that? Like it's getting less light from the sky. Look at this ridiculousness. This is clearly OP. Like, nobody could touch this supply camp after we built 25 <laughs> trebuchets. And they tried. Yeah, hey, uh, hey uh, Gates of Madness, Titan Alliance, um, you know, I know we're all respectful to each other, but yeah, look at that screenshot. That's what's coming to you. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh, man. All right, so I think we spent enough time on World vs. World for today, for forever, I guess. We got a couple more things to get through here. Let's talk Bukas. I mean, Asuras. Later area is awesome and not least of which because of this let me find this other thing here uh, uh there was a image which i have to pull up which you may have seen very briefly at the beginning of this there it is okay now i did not witness this but i will voice it for you because this is something somebody heard in the game hey yada your mama's iq is so low she think norn cows go moot Oh, yeah? What? Your mama's IQ is so low, she thinks crafting is something you do on the Criver. <laughs> well, your mama's IQ is so low, she thinks Silvari and Golem are precious metals. And it goes on and on and finally says, no, but seriously, your mom's really smart. Yeah, yours too. Like, <laughs> this is the most awesome game ever. <laughs> I can't believe the Asura wow. have a Yo Mama <laughs> contest. I Put can't down, get down, the, down. the chat by, uh, I can't even do the voice, but he screams like, by Ogden's hammer, what's saving? Yes! And <laughs> I love that like, guy. Because I'm always in, I'm always by the uh, running back and forth between, right? I just can't help but stop and laugh when I hear that <laughs> scream out loud. <laughs> it's a Norn, he has to scream it out loud. That's how it works. <laughs> <laughs> and this is, now we're going to Silvari, but this is great too. I mean, I don't know if anybody's seen this. It's the, um... <laughs> But how do I begin? One does not simply awaken and rush off to fight a dragon. <laughs> <laughs> I thought this was really tastefully done. Like, anybody who doesn't know this meme on Reddit, the one does not simply X meme, would not even have any clue about this. So this is how you do pop culture references, right? This is how you slide something in there and make it funny as a wink, wink, nudge, nudge without really breaking the immersion of anybody else. I thought I liked anyway. But wait, funny. they actually put that in the game? That's a, that, well, the that's face, not not, no, 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 the, the, the face of Boromir is not actually in the game. That is photoshopped in, but, <laughs> yeah. but the, the text, the text is actually in the game because I experienced that. I went through and saw that in the game on, during my personal story as a, as a Silvari. So anyway, let's jump back to the Asura zone. Uh, what did you guys think? Did, did, who played in Asura? Anybody? I played one the entire weekend. Oh, yeah? Did you play the stupid Asura with the Frosura? Were you playing Frosura? Fro no, no, I was not Frosura. I was Headband Sura. Oh, is that the one that covers your eyes? No, no, that's the thief one. The I was playing one. just like regular Headband I actually cannot take off ever. Once you make your character, you have it on for life. Really? Wait, what? Oh, it's what part of the character creation? It's the hair hair. Yeah, option? it's one of the hairstyles where it's like the sticking up, like I guess, dreads or whatever, and they're held to up by headband, which you can never remove once you pick that hairstyle. Wow. Yeah, pretty pretty awesome. That's not something I noticed. Now, 
I have one story from the Asura event. I only ma played for a very short time with the Asura. I made like a level two, eventually, Asura. But there's one dynamic event that was just awesome, right? So I'm going in this little school, right? And they've got what they call progeny. Basically, the you know, the kids of the Asura. And they're there to learn, you know, something about something. And uh, the, the professor guy is standing in front of them. And he's like, now, what you have in front of you are shrink rays. Don't touch them yet. First, I need to. And immediately, like, all the kids pick up the shrink rays and shrink each other. And now they're, like, running around like the size of a mouse. And he's like, oh, no, no, come back. You weren't supposed to do that yet. And he basically, you know, at that point, a dynamic event starts where he's, you know, imploring passersby to help him round up these stupid little kids who are trying to run away from him because they like being tiny. So you have to grab, an like, an embiggenator, like this, you know, gun that makes things big again. And you have to, like, they, they move around, too. It's not easy. You have to aim it on the ground and try to guess where they're going to be because they're fast little buggers so once you finally get one to grow again and then i was like okay i got that guy let me go find this guy and i get another one and then i start getting hit and i'm like what the hell is hitting me i'm in a school i turn around there's a fly the size of you know a cow that's hitting me and i'm like what the hell how'd this thing get in here so i killed the giant mosquito and then i i, I made another kid big and then there was another giant mosquito and it finally hit me i am accidentally engorginating these mosquitoes when I raise the kids because I can't see them. They're little tiny flies and I make them huge. Like, I am part of the problem. <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant. That was awesome. I have nothing to say about that except that was awesome. So that's awesome. not just like that's just not in the Azura zone though. It's all over this game. You'll have like those amazingly hilarious moments or like these amazingly well thought out sort of events. I mean, I know the Norn has like a event where you basically make a new god for the Grawl, and they're like, "Oh, it's the new god, yes. I'm out of ice." It's amazing. It's, oh, amazing. it's great. <laughs> it's all over, and it's so fantastic just to like go through that stuff. And that's why, even though I, you know, I sometimes criticize the the uh, the challenge level of, like, the scaled down content. Like, I, I feel challenged when we're playing, like, when, when I got to, like, 30 in, in the, the, the Gal, 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 Galdarin fields, I think it is, in, in the last beta weekend, you know, if, a lot of that stuff felt challenging when I was fighting the right level thing, but when I get scaled down, I'm like, ah, uh, this isn't that much fun, but you know what? It doesn't matter if it's challenging to me at that point, because we've got crazy events like this that are just great to experience. That's, like, way better than anything I've ever played before in any MMO. That's going to get me to 80, I tell you what. If they keep pumping out awesome dynamic events like that. So, uh, let me see here. Did this actually load? I think it actually loaded. Freelancer's ridiculously high quality stream finally loaded. So, how about uh, <laughs> that jumping puzzle? Oh, dear. In oh, the Asura area. Is that, don't tell me you uploaded the one, or you loaded the one I failed. Or is that the one I did? I don't know if this is the one you failed. I just oh, this is one. after our flash mob thing. Yeah. <laughs> So everybody's still naked. We decided that while we were waiting for the Metrica Province uh, event to start, we'd all try and do the jumping puzzle. Because there were people like, you guys haven't done the Asura jumping puzzle yet? Oh, mine is an evil laugh. Follow me. <laughs> they were just there to help us fail. It was terrible. They would oh, just man. sit there and wait and be like, yeah, have fun. And I'm like, why? And, and like, then they're like, wrong. <laughs> At this off, point, like, well, Freelancer is being go. told like you're supposed to go down here. Like nobody knew. Everybody else just went right past it to the to the thing and then got sent back at the beginning. Like, eh, you didn't find the correct you know attunement device because it's like hidden. And you're like, damn it! Now I have to do everything all over again. Grr. So well, me and uh, me and Edwin, the the fro Asira there. That's the fro, <laughs> fro Asira. <Sarah>. <laughs> yeah, Sarah. he's got the massive fro there. Um, are the ones that uh, we, we self-proclaim just for kicks and giggles. That There's the, the wind. The jumping puzzle elitist. So he had to show me how to do this one. <laughs> Here we go. Freelancer just jumps in. I got this. And the wind blows him right off. That You know what, though? Playing an elementalist. Armor of Earth, baby. I just walked right across that thing twice. <laughs> Bam. What Wind can't touch me. I got stability. Screw so, you guys. Self-proclaimed, I... Uh... I think we're gonna. We've already set. We're gonna maintain the record for the stone, the jumping puzzle in Worldly World. Oh yeah. Just, just, just putting it out there. Wink, wink, cough, cough. Because uh, we can blow through that, me and Edwin, and uh, like speed buffs, no, no mistakes whatsoever. It's we've got it down pretty pat. Oh yeah, that's what know. you got to be able to do that though. If you remember when I, we were talking back uh, during the jumping puzzles, like the whole Mario feel to it. That's what I get out of it. Like I feel like I'm playing some retro, you know like old game you know it's it's not pve i don't have to read like mpc 
you know, text or anything, but uh, you can still have some fun and uh, it's still sort of skill based. You know, you got to judge your reaction times and stuff. So, uh, uh, is he gonna make it? Is he gonna make it? Uh, oh, nice try. You notice I tried there. to cheat there. With he the tried blink. to dodge. <laughs> <laughs> I'm told the dodging doesn't work. I actually did cheat with stability, I think. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. <laughs> I mean, I was using portals to get back to where I fell down from, so well, see, I think it's all fair game. Well, that I hope ArenaNet fixes, and if they're watching right now, they're going to see. Um, but number one, Mesmers are always a superior class, especially in jumping puzzles, <laughs> because we get mulligans, okay? <laughs> <laughs> if, if I fall off of a jumping puzzle... I activate my portal exit and pop right back up, whereas everybody else has to go all the way back around and uh, redo the whole puzzle. Another thing is, as a guild leader, uh, or as just a group leader, I can bring everybody to the end instantly. I can get to the end, lay a portal exit or a portal entrance, go to the entrance and say, okay, guildies, everybody in, and insupport everybody to the end of the puzzle. <laughs> so... <laughs> But uh, yeah, good times. Yeah, that was that was a fun time. I, I actually have to say that was a good jumping puzzle. If you're doing it on your own, it will be one of those like logic puzzles. Where you're like, why can't I do this? And then you go, oh, of course, I wasn't supposed to do that at all. That's why it's so hard. <laughs> oh man, <laughs> so good times. Yeah, totally. Can't get enough of that good times. All right, anything, any other comments about the Asura area or the Asura in general? Did, anybody, did you play the uh, personal story at all, great, of the Asura? I actually didn't play any of it. I just had a blast kind of like walking around. Like, your shrink ray thing wasn't just one place. It was all the, like the whole Azura race is that. Basically, that's what they do. And just like walking around listening to these like crazy little guys is just fantastic. Yeah, it, it, I, I was impressed with the short amount of time that I spent in the zone with, because uh, I, I love the, the like intellectual guys that just look down their noses at everyone else. They look down their noses at each other, like especially you get that if you read the books. Like they're, these are the biggest intellectual snobs you'll ever see, and they're like, and, but and I'm like I'm I'm like one of those people that's always like, oh man, I hate the anti-intellectualism in America, and I look at these guys and I'm like, they respect intellectualism so much, they look down at people who are Art smart. That's awesome. <laughs> I remember uh, telling Kai, I believe, in game. Um, she she brought the comment of uh, that I wasn't an Asura because uh, she has this thing where she's like, "You're totally an Asura. That's your attitude too." You know, we just yeah. joke around like that. But like, she found out I wasn't an Asura. Well, it's like, you know, starting with Team Legacy, it was default, default, default. I didn't even choose a story. It was just like whatever they give me, and so. It happened to be a blonde human, <laughs> whatever, whatever clicked through the next menu as fast as possible because we had to rush out there in World mm -hmm. Be World. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm gonna be playing it this because their starting area is just so quirky and and, and their animations and, and are so cool. The satire is way through the roof, and I'm a big fan of you know satire and um, just you know sarcastic NPCs. You know when you try to help them and then they make some comment as you leave and stuff. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I love it. I mean, everything about that zone is just amazing. It, uh, I will definitely be rolling in a syrup. All right. Yeah, you broke my immersion. I think I said, like, hey there, shorty, and you're like, I'm a human. I was just like, oh, well, that was ruined. <laughs> <laughs> it, li it literally was as blunt as that. I was like, hey, shorty, and he was just like, I'm a human, just nothing else. I was just like, oh, ruined. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, silence. I, 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 I'd love to get in there and just play some more. I'm definitely making an Asura Guardian. That's that's what I'm going to make because I just love the idea of this tiny little thing going, You shall not pass! <laughs> <laughs> By a little midget. <laughs> tiny midget. Exactly. Have you seen um, the Asura Guardians with their staff? When they do like a certain spell, they like swing around their staff, like they put it in the ground and swing around it. It's oh, crazy. Man. Oh, no. So cool. I, I, I can see it now in our raids in World Be World, like when we're doing a, a defense party, like six people in a doorway, and Bridger's going to be the guardian that just screams in all caps <laughs> in the of the and lays down the wall as they're all, all dessert and rushing in. It'll be great. Oh, man. All right, so... That's the Asura. Let's jump on to the Silvari. Now, I actually made a Silvari and played it a significant way through the personal story, and I, I, I was going for zone completion, and then I was like, nah, let's go play World vs. World. But uh, I had a lot of fun. And one thing I have to say, Kaith is a badass. Like, she is not a tree-hugging bag. Peace, love, man. She's like, what? 
okay, let's quickly tell them that we'll let them go so they give us the information and then afterwards it's like, all right, we'll, we'll, we'll keep our end of the bargain. We won't use the, the piece of blackmail that we had on them. We'll just kill them instead. I was like, whoa, whoa, that's all. You don't get a choice. You're just like, she stabs him. I'm like, okay then. <laughs> that's that. That's all there is to it. I really wow. didn't expect that. <laughs> She's like pragmatic, like this is it. They're the enemy. They're dead now after we got the information out that we needed. I have, I'm happy to promise them anything if I can get the information and then kill them. That's so good. <laughs> oh, man. I'm there's sorry, that was a little from, spoiler. Uh, I, I, I didn't want to give any details. There's a from and Lion's Art. Somebody help me out here uh, about wine. I always help, I always help, can't help but laugh yeah. when hear it. Uh, something it, um, about the price of wine is really high. But it's a great uh, day to drink it or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, it was. It's a bad it's, day to buy wine, but it's a great day to drink it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Savari, Savari just randomly saying that. Like, in a, in a typical Savari uh, monotone, like, it's a great day to drink it, you know? And, <laughs> but yeah. I, I, that's, that's one thing that these two races specifically, like the humans, the Norn, and the Char. I mean, the Char are brought to life by their writing is in, in a sense, but we've seen the Char, you know, culture in many other games, like the warlike peoples, right? The Roman-style militarism, right? We've seen that. We've seen the sort of nature thing that the Norn have going on. We've seen humans, obviously, but the Asura's sort of curiosity and complete ignorance of the world around them with the exception of what they picked up in the dream is a really sort of refreshing in the Silvari. The, sorry, the Silvari the Silvari is what I'm trying to say. Uh, they, they have this sort of refreshing feeling to them. Like you can write for them in a completely different way than any other race that I've experienced in an MMO before. Uh, and the same is true for the Asura. Like, I mean, the gnomes were like annoyingly the the Asura are annoyingly smart in like a badass kind of way. I don't even know how to explain the difference, but I feel like the Asura just feels so much more interesting as the way that they are written, I guess. I don't well, know. over the Silvari, you mean? Or I mean both. General? I mean both. In ge these two races specifically. I just went, you know, yeah. Silvari specifically, but also the Asura feel different in a way from the other, you know, small but smart races of other No, MMOs. yeah, totally. I think that's the reason why I like the Asura and Silvari the most, and they'll probably be the only races that I actually play on launch. But I just think there's something about it like you can't nail down the safari as like the elfy type race because they're not they're they're so much more than that and the same as you said with the asura they're not just like a little race that like gadgets they're just like their attitude the way they talk the way they dress what kind of things they get up to the events they have you know that there's so much thought that goes into it that make them an entire race rather than just the the short intelligent people and i just think they're so quirky and it really does it is fun to play them because you just see them rolling around and the way they love and the way they run and they nearly topple over. It's just like, there's so much stuff that just makes you smile after playing them. And I, I think that's the most important thing. Our guild has a, a little uh, meme slash nickname for them. We call them Cabbage Elves. Um, <laughs> 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 so every, when we see a Sarah, we, uh, we like to make that little joke. It's almost become like a guild, inner guild thing. Um, and I remember doing the, uh, the boxes of fun and you know, the, the one effect that makes you super big. Mm -hmm. So there would be like a human, uh, I forget which somebody in my guild said, it was hilarious, everybody was cracking up. Um, one of the humans was running around like, well, this one ate their green beans, and then a safari went super big. And they were like, well, this one got miracle grow. <laughs> it, it was yeah. hilarious. I, I love safari. They're just so unique. I mean, there's nothing like them in any other game. They don't feel like a bad stereotype. Neither do yeah. they. No, they, they feel like they're really more, uh, what's the, they, I mean, I feel like I'm just being like a giant fanboy right now, but this is really like, you know, I, I, I'm critical of the game in many different ways. Obviously, I love it overall, but, you know, you, you have to maintain perspective and objectivity if you can. You don't want to get too gone into the fanboy zone. So, But still, there's just something about the way that these cultures feel like they have a real history to them and they, their cultural quirks are due to that history and not mm. because they said let's set out to make a race that has these specific traits but more like okay this is the race's backstory how would they be as a culture because of that backstory very D&D-ish yeah. is what I'm thinking 
I think that's the reason why I really like the Silvari as well, because, I mean, most races have, you know, a massive history and there's so much that's gone on. Whereas with the Silvari, because they've only really been around like 25 years, you kind of feel like you're part of that history because it is all new. There's no, there's no deep lore that you need to find out about. It's kind of like, if you want to be a part of the race that's developing, I think that's the best race to choose. Yeah, Shinobi in the chat room nailed it. Cultural identity in some case. They're trying to find their cultural identity. But yeah. at this, in the same way that I was describing, like the Asura having their own backstory, you know, kicked out by Prim Primordius, and they're having this very cultural, that's very intellectual and, and, very, and very respectful of intelligence and things like that. That deep backstory informs their culture in the same way that the lack of backstory informs the Silvari culture. So that's, it's just so cool. Um, but rather than just keep nerdgasming over this, let's let's talk a little bit more about it. Uh, so I played a lot of the personal story, and I I really enjoyed the 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 thing that was in there. Uh, I met a new friend, and then he stole my 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 thing from me, and then I found out that he was a bad guy, and you know it has twists and turns and all kinds of stuff. Uh, one thing that I did notice is that uh, my wife and I we were playing through the personal story, and we both happened to have chosen the same um, objective. We did the uh, the white stag is one of the, the things that you dream about before you come out of the dream. That's one of the choices you make in character creation. And I just happened to log on and I hadn't done any of my personal story. So she came through with my personal story and she helped me. And I got up to the point where she was at and we decided to keep going with the personal story. So she joined me in my personal story. It was the same exact step that she was on in the same exact line. When we finished, she got a little pop-up box that says, would you like to basically complete your own version of this instance, making all the same decisions as me, essentially? Now, in this particular one, I didn't make any decisions, but obviously that's, you know, if there was a place where, do you choose to make them live or die? You know, any of those kind of decisions mm -hmm. where they have in the stories, then you can decide, okay, I did like the choice that that person made. I will choose to simply complete it now and not have to do it again, or no, 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 I don't like the choice that they made. I'm going to go back and redo it and make the right choice or something like that. So that was yeah. really cool. I like that a lot. I really like it because, I mean, for for me being part of a big guild, there's going to be a lot of people who want to kind of all do personal story together. And say you have five people all on the same step, um, you can take them through and then someone might be like, well, actually, I want to choose a different bit. And they can just go back on their own or go back with someone else and kind of redo it. But they still get the whole feel of being able to play with other people and not feeling penalized because they don't want the same kind of story. And I think it's re that is really good. Yeah. And, and, um, Somebody in the chat was uh, was talking about the might valor charm thing, and I I don't I didn't notice anything you know that 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 would affect yet, but I'm guessing that higher up in the personal story or maybe something that they're going to implement. I, I somebody told me that maybe there's like some kind of dialogue tree where if you have enough charm, instead of having to fight somebody, you might be able to you know you know roll a little die in your persuasion roll and see if you can charm them into going your way instead of you know beating it into them or something like that so that or like intimidate them if you have the the ferocity one so that seems kind of interesting and uh we'll see i haven't ever seen that myself have you guys seen any use of for those yet um the only time i kind of saw it in game was in the silvari zone when you turn into the nightmare core and you're speaking to i think the silvari's that you have to rescue something like that and um it's just one of like oh, the hearts yeah. And um, you do, you can speak to them and you can speak to the guards and you pick like one of them. And um, it, they, they, the way they kind of talked back to you was very different and the way they reacted. I thought that was kind of cool. That's right. Okay, that's kind of interesting. Um, so any other things from the Silvari zone that you noticed, uh, Kai? Uh, there's a lot of script. <laughs> a <laughs> lot. Um, I, I really like the mixture of events. I mean, there are... It felt like I leveled faster than I did in the human area. There seemed to be a lot more fluid events. It kind of felt a lot more natural than the uh, human Norn and Char areas from the last beta weekends. Um, I kind of just felt like there was more stuff to do. I don't know if that's just because they've worked on it a lot more or they're trying to pack a lot more content into the zone, but I generally preferred leveling up regardless of me Silvari being my favorite race. The whole zone in general just felt a lot more interesting. And there was a uh, jumping puzzle in the Silvari area that I went and uh, did. It wasn't quite as, you know, uh, mechanical or, or in-depth as the spiral? the spiral one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I started going up that thing, and I'm like, why are these rocks 
just floating in the air. I mean, I know the Asura area, they've super technology people, sure. They've got, you know, little mini micro anti-gravity things on the side of their rocks for some reason, but why are the Silvari rocks floating in the air for me to jump from one to the other? It didn't make any sense. It was breaking my immersion. But in regards to immersion, there is an event um, where these like the zombies kind of like the undead attack the tree and if you're doing the jumping puzzle at that time the tree actually like starts vibrating and you yeah. can't actually jump because like you're you're falling off and the tree is just like shaking so even though it you kind of like oh why is there floating rocks but then someone starts attacking the rock and it starts shaking i think that's when you get drawn back into the whole immersion thing as well absolutely um okay so my immersion involves the fact that I believe that all critters are actually arena net devs watching you, and they almost <laughs> die. That's all. Little cameras. So many critters. He, he, yeah. he directs the and, raid and as the we're running past the, a rabbit. The, NPCs, Somebody... <laughs> the fact that the NPCs don't react only reassures me that my uh, paranoia is actually true. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, arena net, I'm on to you. Do I you want play every... with, like, a little tinfoil hat on? Like... No, he I lines. just make sure that I try to one-up my damage on the squirrel that I hit last time. <laughs> That's right. You get the uh, achievement for over, what is it, over, I, over I have hit, over to kill? activate damage buffs just to hit the next squirrel. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. That's so, my lore for you. It's my personal story. Overall, the Silvari <laughs> zone, the grove was beautiful. Radisum yeah. is crazy cool looking. We can talk about that all day. But uh, the last thing I think we need to talk about with regards to the Silvari is uh, last time we were talking about how Guardians are OP, right? They had ridiculous survivability. At this point, Silvari Rangers, what the f***? <laughs> I mean, really? Those stupid roots all the time in World vs. World. Nothing I can do. Just stuck there in the roots, have to shoot my fireball at my feet to try and get out of them. <laughs> this is why you have to play the superior class Bridger, because the superior class has a blink that gets you out of any stun or root. Oh, I had a thing that yeah. I could use. It was just still annoying. I'm trying to channel <laughs> the annoyance that other people are having, all right? That's what I'm trying to do. No, the roots, the roots were very annoying. And the fact that you'd see these Savari just rush you just to, just to use that ability, like, they didn't even have friends, you know, following them to kill you. It was just to root you, you know, and then run away as fast as they could. Um, but yeah, it was quite annoying. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think it was overpowered or anything. Though. It, I mean, it's, it's... It, the thing that that most people are saying is the ranger has a very similar ability on like a hundred and twenty second cooldown, and the silvari, you know, ability is on like a twenty second cooldown. So that's why people were saying that was ridiculous because it's basically, if, if I understand it correctly, it's basically better than the elite, and it's you know more often usable. But uh, I could I could be a little bit wrong on that. I didn't try it myself. All right. Anyway, I'm sure we'll see uh, things change plenty before the actual launch, so no real use in complaining about it now. But it's fun to make a note. Let's jump over to structured PvP. Did you play any structured PvP freelancer? Uh, I played a little bit with my guys, yeah, but mainly I was uh, taking my breaks from World v. World and watching them on their stream um, and having them blow my mind because um, they've uh, they've really developed their skills since the last BWE. And plus we brought on that, um, you know, our official European team as well, a bunch of uh, old GW1 bets uh, like Sheepy, Rotten, Juan B, et cetera, and um, they were doing really well. So I was just watching them and watching their streams, which it was a little little different watching a German, you know, stream, uh, having all of them speak German so fast to each other and do all these complex maneuvers. And then I was watching the U.S. side, RTL guys over there, and they uh, they won, uh, they lost three matches out of, uh, I think, like the 40 or so they recorded. And, of course, if you guys go to um, uh, YouTube.com forward slash uh, Team Legacy PvP, they, were, they make sure to make a point to upload one PvP video a day. It doesn't matter if they won or lost. The important thing is to learn something from it. Um, we're not, you know, big elitist pricks where we only show the best footage. We actually upload a lot of uh, video that we lost, and we discuss in the video how we lost that. Um, but uh, yeah, structure PvP, uh, Legacy of the Faux Fire. What'd you think about that, Bridget? I did played, you play it at all? I did play it a little bit. I, I knew I needed to talk about it, so I jumped in like in the middle of doing a bunch of other stuff, and I played it for about two or three rounds. Um, the layout is very interesting. It seems like a, a char kind of uh, industrial area that when I was looking at it, uh, and 
It obviously has the three capture points as per normal for all the other maps, but the special secondary mechanic here is a guild lord uh, protected by a couple of guards, essentially, and if you kill the guild lord, you get 100 points. And we learned about that before the actual beta weekend event, and I played through it, and actually what we didn't learn, what we didn't know about is that the guild lord itself and the base that the guild lord and you sort of are in when you spawn is actually protected by some doors and walls. Like, it's actually got an actual base, and they have to bash down the doors first. And, you know, it doesn't take long to bash down the doors, but it's a kind of a neat little touch that you have the chance to fire at them from the battlements and prevent them from bashing down the door. Uh, it still seems pretty easy overall to kill the guild lord. Like, I, I spawned in. He was there. He was fine. The doors were open. I went to fight at the middle point for a little bit. I died. I came back. Guild lord is being killed. Door just smashed down. I was like, oh, well, that was quick. Speaking of, speaking of which, uh, Sheepy uh, is in chat right now. Uh, I had heard a couple times from the structure PVPers that on Legacy of Fofire, basically whoever holds the mid wins. And when I was watching the streams, it turned out to be very much that. Um, I know like Sheepy's team there, uh, he has uh, an incredible team going. If they couldn't hold mid in that initial battle, it was pretty much lost. Like I never saw a round where the U.S. team or the EU team could rush the mid, lose the mid, and then come back from the battle. There's very, very few of them. Is it so, because of the um, positioning advantage that the mid gives you? Yep, pretty much. And, um, I mean, it's – I don't know. I, I don't see why it should change. I mean, it's just – we're going to have to, as far as Team Legacy and everybody listening, if you're doing structure PvP, that whole map is focused around making a strategy that holds that middle. That's what it's all about because there's so much mobility from the middle and just so much control holding the middle that if you don't focus there, you, you, you lose, period. It's not like Kylo, where if somebody holds the middle, okay, well, no big deal, we'll just blow trebuchets at it. It's actually with Kylo, uh, the focus, the meta game right now, and a lot of people argue it, but the, what I understood when I was watching the meta game for Kylo is whoever has the trebuchets wins. You know, whoever can keep their trebuchet alive because you get so good at those trebuchets, and of course, I'm. If you go, if you all of you go back to Tales of Tyria, like one through five, I oh, said the man. trebuchet was useless. They call them gimmicks. But, yeah, I, I call it a gimmicky. All sorts of stuff. I, I couldn't be more wrong. And uh, whoever holds these trebuchets uh, could just nuke the middle, and you could have essentially one or two people holding the middle in, in Kylo. Whereas there is no trebuchet concept on Faux Fire, so. Uh, you really got to focus a lot more on it. It's it's interesting, and uh, I hope that I get to do a lot more structured PvP. It's just, of course, like with all the other alliances and guilds out there, we were so focused on getting our world v world strategies down pat because you don't get much experience with that. Whereas structured PvP, exactly. And and uh, you know when the epic is happening, you got to be there. <laughs> structured right. PvP you can be epic every time, but when you get you know 50 people together, that doesn't happen all the time. Uh, all right, so uh, let's see. Um, what do you guys? What, so, uh, I, I, great. You said you didn't play any structured PvP. Kai, did you play any structured PvP? Um, not this beta weekend, no. But the beta weekend number two, I pretty much spent the whole, entire time doing structured PvP. But this past one, I didn't. So I don't know if much changed or anything like that. But I do enjoy it. So freelancer, I guess I'll ask you then. Better than Forest of Niflhel? Uh, I think. I assume that you. You're probably. Uh, I think the. the panel was unanimous the last couple of times that I asked that Forest of Niflhel was the better map than Kylo, uh, but what do you think about Legacy of the Faux Fire? Where does it fit in the ranking uh, of uh, your favorite map? Uh, I know, I'm, I'm kind of subject to enjoying Faux Fire the most, just because I like the whole Grand Arena in the middle there. Um, there was a lot of strategies mixed up between uh, the TL guys of basically uh, not to spoil their individual builds, but their general idea was rush the middle, then separate, basically have one guy on each side um, or two guys running to one side towards the enemy and holding those points and then coming back to the middle on those little cliff sides. If you remember on Faux Fire Bridger, or if anybody can uh, kind of visualize it with me, it's sort of like an arena with cliffs on the sides. And so you have a big advantage of your guys on the corner points, which aren't far away at all. Actually, a Mesmer portal, if you watch my stream, Bridger, I could cover the middle point and the outside point with a portal 24-7 nonstop because there was just no distance there. Um, it seems like uh, mobility in that map is not so important as much as being able to hold the point because you can get one point to another so fast in there. Whoever has more Guardians pretty much wins the map is what I was noticing because if, if you're a Guardian, you control a point forever. Uh, you can, it'll take forever for two players or three players even to take out a Guardian 
on that middle point. So having two Guardians helps even more. Of course, the meta is all out in the open right now. I know my teams are probably saying, well, you can do this, well, you can do this. Everybody has their own strategy, but uh, definitely my favorite was uh, Fofar out of all of them. Mainly because of the lack of RNG. You know, there's no random effects there. There's mm -hmm. no, there's no, um, I forget the name of the, the bosses, but you know, there's no mini bosses like there is on the, um, you know, on the other map and there's no trebuchets. So it's, it's just a very set map. It's small. I wish it could have been a little bit larger, but it's, there's no RNG there. It's very set, like, the way it plays. All right. I only played one or two maps on Faux Fire, so I'm not really ready to say this is definitely the best or the worst map, but I think I rank it somewhere next to Kylo, uh, maybe better than Kylo. I need to play it more to really, you know, solidify my opinion, but I really, really do like the Forest and the Niflhelm map. I like the layout. I like the openness of it. I like the, the distance that it provides and the very specific, you know, strategic advantages of coming up behind the middle but needing to fall down into the middle in order to actually capture it or decapture it. Like, there's a lot of very interesting decisions that can be made on that map so i still like that one the most i think uh but uh but but yeah definitely faux fire is no slacker i'm definitely not hating on it yet um and i have no reason to think that i would necessarily i, I do like that it's very different from the other maps like you said it's it's a lot about the center and the positioning there is very important so i i like how you know kylo is very choke pointy and there's a lot of different ways through this maze work where you can't really see other people to begin with or you can go high and go to the top route and then forest is all sort of single routes everywhere but they're not mazy they're more like tunnely and and then you have you know it's more open and then you have you know faux fire which has a very different layout so i like that they're all very different i'm very interested to see what the last one is which we won't see probably until release unless they have some special coming out sometime in the Are we sure there's going to be like one more for certain or is that the idea yeah, they said I mean, there's four. They've always said that there's four. four. And okay. there's rumors that this fourth one is going to have some kind of water uh, aspect to it, like a chunk, like there might be a capture point underwater or something. I think they, they kind of revealed that during one of the uh, Reddit um, question and answers that they had, the, the AMAs. Okay. So, um, yeah, we didn't play a whole lot of structured PvP, so we'll, we'll maybe bring the D1A guys back on uh, sometime in the near future to talk about their impression of beta weekend number three. That, that's one of the things I'm, I'm kind of throwing around in my head for future episodes. But uh, for now, I guess that's kind of it on structured you know, PvP. We just happened, didn't happen to do that. Like Freelancer said, structured PvP is going to be there anytime, and it's probably going to get better more by release than anything else because balance is sort of the last thing that's sliding into place here, right? I mean, PvE has been in place for a long well, time, but... Uh, yeah, it's... There, I mean, for... I'm saying it from my perspective to look at it from a, a guild leader. I'm handling all these different things, but for structured PvPers, I mean, there's dedicated guilds and teams out there. That's all they do. Um, and they do it very, very well. Not just Team Legacy. There's other teams out there doing very well. Uh, team Paradigm, we went up against them, lost against them, won against them, lost against them. Um, they were neck and neck. There was an SS team. There, there's, there was a couple of really good teams. I heard there. we fight against an arena net team as well. That we did, like and that we, cool. we won. And we're going to be putting that video out. That oh, we faced cool. their, we faced their main team. That was really good. Um, and we had they stomped our butts last BWE. So it was for our guys. It was really exciting to beat them this time. Cool. Um, they've gotten. I'm really proud of them. They've gotten a lot better. But of all these teams out there, um, somebody was just asking, what about our straight talk episode? Um, you know, we're still waiting for that esports spectator type, you know, mode in the in the scene to kick off because, as you guys know, there's not much to talk about right now. We don't we don't want to bring DJ Wheat and we don't want to bring on these other casters, which we are in contact with. They're ready to go with us. Um, they've given us the go ahead. We don't want to bring them on and just talk nonsense. We want to have solid footage. Mm -hmm. We want to have a, a spectate mode, possibly a tournament, perhaps. You know. Team Legacy is doing our, our own little $500 tournament, $1,000 possibly, uh, with TeamSpeak. And, you know, we want to get some solid footage out there. We don't want to just bring on these big names and do these interviews and just talk about the same nonsense over and over. It would so. be speculation because what usually gets talked about on these kind of shows is the meta, is, is, is you know, okay, what's the new thing this week that people are utilizing? And, oh, oh, so-and-so figured out a brand new build that's working really well, and it counters this other thing. I mean, those kinds of discussions are what's really interesting to a lot of PvPers. And our meta is based on, you know, three beta weekends, 
And like we haven't had any, you know, contact with the game in the last three weeks. We have no idea what the meta is like internally. We have no idea what the meta is going to be like when the game comes out because skills can easily change between now and then. So once the game comes out, once we see teams actually fighting, a meta is going to actually materialize and we'll have something to talk about. But until then, it's all speculation. And that's that's really the, the situation where we're at right now. So certainly that is, like Freelancer said, in the works. It's still on the back burner. It's not gone. It's, you know, we're keeping it lukewarm. We're ready to turn yeah, up the heat. It's, it's lukewarm because if we're going to do something, Bridger, we're going to do it right. Exactly. Right? There you go. Exactly. Okay. So uh, with that having been said, I think we're, we're about to come to a close, but we would like to invite you to share your beta weekend event number three stories with us, and maybe we'll, we'll post a few of them or talk about them uh, on the next show. Uh, Freelancer started a thread on the Guild Wars 2 Guru in the Athenium chamber under Stone Mist Castle to talk about uh, World vs. World, amongst other things. He posted a bunch of screenshots that he took. I put, I, I put a couple of those in here earlier, um, and you know you can see our little Gollum art. We made a mini golem army this time uh, along with our massive <laughs> treb army and uh, we basically said okay let's let's talk about awesome things that happen in world versus world this time so this is a cool thread I've got a link in the show notes if you guys want to contribute and uh, we'll if we get any really good stories in here we'll talk about them on the next show so definitely go check that out again links in the show notes talesofteria.com is where you can find those and you can also uh, find that in the description of the YouTube channel if you are watching it uh, from YouTube now the last Last thing I want to say is don't go anywhere, ladies and gentlemen, because we have more awesome coming your way. I know you had a nice night planned with the wife or boyfriend or girlfriend, what have you, but it's not going to happen unless they like Team Fortress 2. That's right, Team Fortress 2 week is kicking off here at Team Legacy. Killy Kill is uh, spearheading that right now. I've got a link to the thread, and I will give that to you right now in the chat room. It's got all the details, and uh, the first server, I'll throw that link in the chat room as well. It's on a payload map. Get in there while it's good. If you want to participate, the best way to do it is to come on our TeamSpeak server right now, because that is where you will find uh, the, all of the other people that are participating in this. It's going to be a blast. There's no skill requirement. It's just good clean fun tf2 you can have fun no matter how skilled you are even if you've never played it before it's a free game get in there throw some rockets get some critical hits make the make the veterans go damn you critical hits and then you know laugh your ass off right to the bank it's great it's so much fun <laughs> i can't even i'm gonna jump right in now in a few minutes so join me join the rest of team legacy and the whole community everyone is invited if we fill up one server we'll find another one and fill that one up too so definitely check that out all you have to do download TeamSpeak. The information for our TeamSpeak server is right on the uh, teamlegacy.net homepage, uh, and also all the information is in the forums under the community section if you're trying to find us there as well. So with that, I think that's about it. Anything else we wanted to mention before we go here tonight, guys? Uh, no, not really. Looking no. forward to somebody attempting to backstab me in Team Fortress. That's right. You put out a public... <laughs> Uh, challenge to everyone trying to uh, yeah, get you. Yeah, it's not really a challenge. Nobody's going to be able to do it. So, yeah. <laughs> so it is a challenge, Ooh. but it's not a challenge because they can't do it. Uh, okay. No, good times, good times. It's it's promoting <laughs> the community. I mean, anybody that's that's bored or anybody. Uh, I mean, hell, we're all in a Guild Wars two uh, binge now, and we're all waiting for the next one. So, if you're bored, uh, join us. Have some good times. Try to kill Bridger. It's a headshot for me. Oh Thank yeah, you. absolutely. You're not going to be able to kill me though. I'm going to be a soldier. And soldiers have lots of life, and that's all there is to it. All right, guys. Signing off. I'm Bridger. Thanks for watching. See you guys. Bye. See ya.